for. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, uh, if you want to learn more about what I'm doing, the magazine, uh, social media, YouTube, uh, I've got a podcast as well. Um, and I have some coffee recommendations also on that webpage you see there, extractedmagazine.com uh, slash ASW. Uh, you, can, you can sign up to my newsletter as well. So go there. Uh, okay, so a little bit about me. I want to share kind of what got me into this because it, there's this like inflection point that everyone I know who uh, gets obsessed with coffee kind of comes to. Um, it wasn't that long ago uh, that I actually really didn't like coffee at all. I didn't drink it through college or anything like that. I didn't start drinking it until uh, I started working and I really needed the caffeine and it was a kind of a nice break, but I, I found coffee rather disgusting. Uh, but I was intrigued because I always heard people talk about the intricate flavors, uh, but it never made sense to me. Um, fast forward, I, I started exploring a lot of independent coffee shops. So I, actually, I live in Seattle, so home of Starbucks, of course, um, and they were everywhere. That's how I got into it. Um, but I always figured there had to be more to it. Uh, one day, found myself in a tiny little coffee shop, uh, room enough for like four people and the barista, and it was just me and the barista. Um, it was a hot day, still remember it. Uh, and uh, he walked in like tired and the barista was like, so what can I get you? And I kind of stared at his, uh, you know, fancy chalkboard and just sighed and was like, uh, coffee, man, I don't know. And he laughed and he said, can I make you a bunch of things? And he started just making me all sorts of drinks, handed me an espresso, which until that point, I had always thought of it as, as just a more concentrated, sort of bitter, nasty form of the, what essentially was bitter black water to me anyways. Um, hesitantly took a sip and was uh, fantastically delighted to find sweet lemons and honey and uh, an assortment of flavors that I had never associated with coffee before. Um, and, and I had the same experience with all the other coffees he, he shared with me that day. And, and it left me with this, this expression, this impression of why the heck had no one ever told me that coffee could actually taste good. It didn't just have to not taste bad. It can actually taste fantastically amazing. So um, I don't know if any of you have had that experience. I know everyone that I know in coffee has had an experience like that, and that's what got them into coffee. So I'm hoping uh, that I can share something with you today that can take you to that point as well. So... Um, a little bit about what uh, I want to talk about today, um, just a quick outline. So I, I am going to do a little bit of coffee history. I'm going to try to move through that quickly. There's, there's way too much that I could talk about for one webinar, um, but I want to share some insight on coffee history because this will explain why coffee is the way it is today. Um, why kind of in a lot of ways why most of the coffee that we consume tastes the way it does uh and and it's really intriguing so i want to share that and then i'm going to go over what i call the four core fundamentals of brewing great coffee at home uh, so these are things if you understand and master them it doesn't matter how you brew your coffee what the coffee is uh you can brew a great cup of coffee and you can uh, play with these fundamentals to experiment and get deeper into coffee and enjoyment and that sort of thing um, I have a note here on espresso. As I was uh, testing out my presentation, I, I realized that it was going on way too long. I am not an expert on espresso, but a number of you who responded to the survey mentioned that you prefer espresso. So I, I really wanted to include that in there. I'm gonna include some notes on espresso through my presentation, but I'm not going to get to brewing it in uh, what I'm talking about. I'm actually going to put that at the end. Uh, so if we still have time or if some of you want to hang around, I can get to brewing espresso. I do have a machine here. Um, it's just not really my bailiwick, but I know a few things about a few things. And then I'm going to answer all your questions. So everyone who put a question in on the survey, I'm going to answer each and every one of those. And then if you have further questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get to those as well. Uh, hopefully this is fun for everyone. Okay, so really quick, what is coffee? I uh, have to put this in here because if you, if you haven't seen this before, it does kind of boggle the mind at the beginning, but coffee is actually a fruit. It's a fruit much like a cherry, um, has generally two pits. Occasionally coffee has one pit. If you ever see a roaster selling a pea berry, 
that's from a coffee cherry that grew on one pit. But uh, coffee is, is a fruit. It grows on trees that are generally trimmed to be like bushes. And then the uh, pits are essentially processed out of the fruit in a variety of different ways. And that whole process of growing uh, this fruit and taking the pit out of it, that whole process is what essentially determines the end flavor that you get. Uh, so there's an there's a infinite number of ways seemingly to uh, do this process and get a large number of different uh, experiences. These are, by the way, these are pictures actually from Yemen. Uh, do a lot of work with um, folks who, who grow coffee in Yemen and, and roast coffee. So these are, are on the screen, you're seeing coffee trees and coffee being dried. Um, again, not going to really get into that. I just wanted to give you uh, an understanding that coffee is actually a fruit and how it's grown, where it's grown, these are all uh, tremendous factors in the end result that you get when you enjoy your cup of coffee. Okay, let's dive into the history. So origins of coffee, you may have heard of this. Um, coffee as we know it comes from generally East Africa. Uh, there are a, a number of species, the, the two main ones that we uh, enjoy are Arabica and Robusta, although most people are drinking typically Arabica. That is the kind of species that um, has the most flavor, the most intricate flavor and enjoyment. Robusta is, is the second most grown and sold coffee because it grows much easier than Arabica, much faster, cheaper. Uh, unfortunately, it tastes like rubber. So um, most of the time when you're enjoying a coffee, it's not Robusta, it's most likely Arabica. There are some other species as well. Um, the only other one that I've actually tried so far is called Eugenoides, which intriguingly is similar to Arabica in kind of delicacy and intricacy of flavors, but like very creamy. It's almost like you, you took an Arabica and you put uh, milk in it, but it's just the water and the coffee. Um, so I want to like dive into where the coffee as we know it, Arabica comes from, who discovered it. And you've probably heard of the legend of Kaldi and his goats. Uh, so I'm going to quickly cover that. The legend goes that a goat herd named Kaldi one day discovered his goats prancing about uh, and he discovered, oh, they're eating this fruit and it's coffee. But how do you think it went from a goat eating fruit to coffee as we know it today, uh, brewed this roasted seed of that coffee brewed? Um, showing some pictures from the uh, East African coffee ceremony here. Um, since that's where the coffee originated from, you would think that the, the legends would have included the uh, evolution of that process as well. So I'm, I'm sure there's some truth to that, that story. What I want to get into here without going ridiculously deep into this is how did we get from coffee as a fruit to coffee as a, a roasted drinkable thing? Just some more shots of the East African coffee ceremony. Um, so the, the discovery, and I, I did a lot of research into the text on this, the d discovery of coffee that kind of weaves in with Kaldi and his goats is actually by uh, uh, Yemeni Sufi monks. So the story goes that this one particular monk, Ali ibn Omar al-Shadili, was traveling through Ethiopia. Perhaps he was the one who observed the goats. Uh, discovered this fruit that people there and had been for for a very long time had been eating the fruit they also they also cooked the fruit in in stews um, they they took the fruit sometimes they packed it in uh, balls of fat as like kind of like an energy bar kind of thing so coffee was actually widely consumed in East Africa for a long time people uh, obviously knew about it it grew wild um, but it was the Yemeni Sufi monks who discovered it took the coffee back to Yemen and then actually applied their knowledge of Chinese tea to the plant and figured out how to you know, take the seed out of it, roast it and brew the coffee that way. And became very popular because those monks were able to consume this drink and stay up much later than everyone else and pray a lot more. Uh, so they, they, they were able to spread the, the fame of this drink um, because of their ability to pray more than everyone else. Uh, and of course of, of its, uh, uh, deliciousness that Yemeni called it uh, the wine of the bean. Um, and there's also some, some interesting aspects to uh, how the Yemeni took coffee and grew it. Uh, not too long before that, this was sometime in the, the 1200s to 1400s, and not long before that the Yemeni were actually well known in the world for uh, growing and, and producing wine, uh, but with the um, 
advent of Islam, uh, wine became outlawed. They essentially replaced their grapes with coffee trees, applied the same uh, growing techniques and had really amazing results. So this is a picture from uh, the mountains of Yemen. So now this is, this is the really cool thing that I want, uh, want to share, this really cool point. So we have coffee grow from Ethiopia to Yemen. This is around the 1400s. For a couple hundred years, Yemen was the only source of coffee in the world. It was traded out of the port of Mocha. And you couldn't take coffee out of Yemen any other way under penalty of death. Uh, starting in about the 1600s, uh, several things happened. Uh, first, a tree was gifted to Amsterdam, uh, which uh, the cutting of that then eventually ended up with the King of France. Later in the 1600s, the Dutch stole trees from Yemen and took them to Java. Uh, so now you have Mocha Java, uh, a little fun side bit. The port of mocha, and you, you're probably familiar with the mocha coffee, which is like coffee with chocolate in it. After coffee started spreading everywhere, people wanted to replicate the legendary coffee from the port of mocha, which was very chocolatey. So they took their coffee and they added chocolate to it. And that's where mocha comes from. Um, okay, so coffee stolen from Yemen, also uh, by a uh, Indian monk, uh, managed to smuggle some seeds out to India. But if you take a look, this, this tree that went to Amsterdam and then the cutting that went to France, it was from that one tree, that cutting, that all the coffee in Central and South America comes from. So that plants from that tree were taken to uh, Haiti and then spread throughout everywhere in Central and South America. So actually, and then and from there around the rest of the world. So most of the coffee that we know, almost all the coffee that we know of now is grown between the tropics. There are a couple occasion uh, exceptions because of the changing climate, um, but between the tropics and most of that coffee comes from one tree. So this is the really intriguing aspect of it. If you, you think about all the coffee that you've consumed, most of it is very, very genetically similar. There's almost no variation between that. Um, throughout most of the world of Arabica coffees, there are about 30 known varieties. But if you look in Ethiopia, it is estimated that there are over 10,000 wild varieties of Arabica coffee. Uh, and that is what I want, uh, that is what I want you to understand, is that there's this massive, intricate um, complexity of, of wild varieties of coffee in, in Ethiopia and probably Yemen as well. Um, Yemeni coffee is really uh, only coming back strong in the last couple of years as some uh, interesting folk have been working on helping that um, come back. But throughout most of the world, most of the coffee is the same. Yet, if you compare a coffee from, like, for say, Colombia to Peru, it can taste wildly different. Uh, and that is one of the most fascinating things about coffee is that even though um, one coffee is so very genetically the same as another, it can still taste uh, wildly different just due to the, the soil that it was grown in, the weather, um, the, uh, how it was processed, handled, roasted, all of these factors combine. Coffee is the most complex thing that we consume. Um, but if you go to Ethiopia and you start exploring Ethiopian coffees, you discover uh, even more wildly different uh, flavors. That's really quite fascinating. So that is, that is the key takeaway that I wanted to include from uh, about the history of coffee. Okay, before I get into my four fundamentals, I do wanna talk about what happens during a brew. Um, this is uh, like on a, on a basic level, but very important to, to like understand this aspect. So when you're brewing coffee, you're taking your roasted beans, you're grinding that, and then you're passing water through it, or you're having the, the grounds and the water sit together. What's happening is that water is extracting the soluble compounds from the beans, which make up the, the taste and aroma that we get in the cup of coffee. Uh, it, so everything that you do with brewing coffee, whether it's uh, doing, a, doing a pour over through a filter, you have a French press, or you have an espresso, the, you're, you're creating this interaction where the water extracts the soluble compounds. Um, and just as a side note, it is the roasting process which makes those compounds soluble and able to extract with the water. Uh, so just keep that in mind as we go through a few things. So uh, these four core fundamentals. So the reason I'm going over these is as I said at the beginning, if you can, uh, if you understand these and master these, th these are the four most important things to brewing coffee at home. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of in-depth things you can get into uh, as far as brewing coffee, um, the, the science of it, the, the art of it. But you start with these, 
and you can brew uh, a really fantastic cup of coffee and you understand what it is that you can adjust to explore and learn more. Um, so if you, if you don't get these, then you're going to have a really hard time uh, brewing delicious coffees, brewing them consistently and exploring coffee. So I want to go through these. Um, and actually, I'm going to uh, change up my view here so I can kind of brew along with you. Um, let me see here. What is our time at so far? 20 minutes. Good. Okay. So um, the number one uh, most important thing to do is to brew with ratio. So this is actually where most people uh, make a mistake. Well, I, I don't know, I call it a mistake, but this is something that most people um, kind of miss out on when they're brewing coffee. This is where a lot of the, the challenges happen with creating a good cup of coffee is you just don't use the right amount of coffee and water. And, and the process is actually quite, uh, quite simple. Um, I'm going to come back to here to myself for a moment. Uh, so coffee is best brewed, uh, best brewed by weight. The, a lot of people brew it by volume, but the, the challenge is if you brew coffee by volume, uh, the, the, the thing about coffee is that it's the volume of it varies from, um, all sorts of things from, uh, roast, uh, style to, um, to, uh, variations in, in origin and type of coffee. In fact, I'm going to show you two beans here. Uh, really quick. I'm going to switch to this camera. Hello. So you can see two different coffee beans, wildly different sizes. Um, so I just wanted to make that point that uh, volume and sizing of coffee is a tricky subject. So what we do in coffee and the craft of coffee is we brew with ratios. We measure the coffee and the water that we use in the brew in grams. And a good standard ratio to start with is 17 to 1. So that's 17 grams of water for every one gram of coffee that you use. And I'll just demonstrate simply here. I'm going to uh, brew a cup of coffee on here using the Kalita Wave, uh, which is a, is a pour over brew method. And as I said, these fundamentals apply pretty much no matter what you're doing. I'm going to make a comment on espresso in a moment. Um, so it doesn't as far as like brewed coffee goes, this exact, this ratio uh, applies for pour overs, for French press, um, anything that you might do brewing coffee. Once you understand that, you can play around with the ratio. You can go, um, you know, up or down or however you, you see fit. So what I'm going to brew on this uh, Kalita wave is um, I have kind of a set recipe in my head, which is roughly between roughly 16 and a half to one, I think. Uh, but I do 25 grams of coffee to 400 grams of water. So very simply, I'm going to measure out. I suppose you don't need to see the back of my head. <laughs> measure out uh, 25 grams of coffee, roughly speaking. You know, it doesn't have to be super exact, but, you know, get, get, get close to there. Uh, you know, the, the point of doing this kind of, kind of practice is uh, not just getting a good balanced brew. Um, there, there is a, a generally accepted uh, balance of brewed solids in your cup of coffee that the Specialty Coffee Association has dictated. And uh, using ratios like this uh, help you get to that. Um, okay. Whoa. So uh, the Kalita wave, I use, uh, like I said, 25 grams of coffee, and then um, I'm going to brew with 400 grams of water. I'm going to get to that in a moment. If, for example, to give you an example of uh, using an auto drip machine, for example, I have a, I have a large auto drip machine here that, that can brew 1,800 milliliters. And you might approach the, um, usually, well, usually when I'm using an auto drip machine, I approach it the other way around because I know how much water I'm going to put in. So from there, I can figure out how much coffee to use. So uh, a, a tidbit on that, uh, one milliliter is one gram. That's not technically 100% accurate, but it's good enough for coffee work. So that's typically what we do is we consider one milliliter to be one gram uh, of water. 
So if I'm brewing with 1800 milliliter, 1800 milliliters of water and I want to use an 18 to one ratio, for example, then I know that I can put 100 grams of coffee into the brewer. Uh, one thing that you won't see me talking about in these fundamentals is grind size uh, because that varies depending upon the technique. But the thing is, if you get these fundamentals down, you can just change up your grind size really easily to find out which, which is best uh, for the result you want to get. Um, okay. I'm actually going to uh, really quickly jump off screen and turn on my water. I have a slightly awkward situation. Hold on. my electric kettle uh, decided to um, kick the bucket. So I'm having to replace it and use a stovetop kettle. Um, okay, so while, while that's going, uh, I'm gonna continue on with the fundamentals so that we can have good timing here. Okay, the second most important one, and, and also, as I said, if you have questions along the way, feel free to leave them in chat. Uh, I'll answer them towards the end. Um, I actually don't have the chat window up here right now, but how are we doing? Okay, good. Okay, next most important fundamental, uh, fresh coffee. So once you are weighing your coffee in your brew, um, the next most important thing to getting into enjoying the craft and vibrancy of coffee is to use fresh roasted coffee. And I'll, I'll just explain this from my experience, my point of view. I buy coffee that has been roasted uh, within the past week. Uh, and I always try to do that. And you can, um, you can do that typically. Most coffee roasters who roast on demand will include a roasted on date on their bag. So uh, I will only buy coffee either from roasters I know who, who do this practice or if I'm in a store and I'm looking at, at bags of coffee, I will look for a roasted on date and then I will look for that date to be sometime in the last week. If the bag doesn't have a roasted on date, uh, sometimes it'll just have a date with no label. Uh, I, I have always found that that is a roasted on date as well. The other practice that roasters do is they say goodbye uh, a certain date. That doesn't mean anything. That could, be, that could mean that it was roasted a month ago. It could be three months. It could be a year. There really is no expiration on coffee. Uh, but what happens is and this is actually happening when the coffee is green uh, as well, but that's before it's roasted. Uh, but all, uh, this process accelerates. The coffee is constantly going through a chemical change uh, and giving off gases and just changing how it tastes. The, the roasting process, which creates the ability to extract the soluble compounds in water, accelerates that process greatly. So if you take a roasted coffee and you wait a month, uh, essentially what happens is you lose a lot of vibrancy of the taste. Um, some coffees, depending on the quality, can also uh, either create or reveal poor quality tastes uh, after a certain time period. Um, it's hard to say exactly what's going to happen after a time, but it's generally uh, said that there's this, this golden sort of window of coffee, and that's from about a week after roast to about three weeks after roast. So you've got like 14 days. And there is a, a reason to wait a few days after roast at least, and that's because just prior to roasting, the roasted coffee is off-gassing huge amounts. Uh, and so if you brew a coffee that is, has just been roasted, especially with um, like commercial machines, it, it's a little bit different if you're doing tiny batches and home roasting. But uh, if you brew a coffee that's just been roasted, you're going to run into a lot of challenges with uh, off-gassing. You're going to get some undesirable tastes that either will um, make the coffee not taste as good or will at the very least interfere with your ability to taste the bright, delicious flavors that you're looking for. So, uh, the best advice is to, to wait a few days after roast and then try to consume that coffee within, um, two to three weeks. So again, from my point of view, typically I buy a coffee, I'm expecting to consume that bag of coffee within a week or two. Uh, and that's, that's just my focus. Uh, so fresh coffee. Uh, so again, look for those roasted on dates. And then the best thing that you can do is to find some local coffee roasters. There's nothing quite like uh, speaking to directly a coffee roaster, uh, getting to know them, 
uh, know their process and buy coffee directly from them. That is absolutely one of the best things that you can do hands down. Uh, and that will also guarantee that you're getting fresh coffee as well. Uh, I mean, if you, if you speak to a coffee roaster and you find out that they, uh, yes, they, they roast coffee themselves, but then they, you know, sit the coffee on their shelves for months. Maybe you don't want to do that, but I've never met a coffee roaster in person, like a smaller coffee roaster who does that practice because uh, coffee just does not shelf well. Uh, okay, one second, I have to go grab the boiling water. All right, this is timely because the next thing I'm gonna do, the next item is to grind right before you brew, which is what I'm about to do. So let's go ahead and switch over here. Uh, and I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna mute uh, while I do this really quick. So uh, I don't blast your eardrums. So pardon me while I grind. Okay, so you've got your fresh roasted coffee. You um, have, have weighed out the right amount of coffee that you want to use. And now it's time to brew it. Well, the next best thing you can do is to grind right before you brew. There's a little bit of controversy on this and uh, some different points of view. But to me, this is all about getting into and enjoying the craft of coffee. Just like when coffee is roasted, after the roasting process, it's off-gassing, it's, it's, it's changing its flavors. You know, after a month of roast, you've lost a lot of vibrancy. The same thing goes with, with grinding coffee. I've just ground this coffee. If I wait 15 minutes, the taste will change significantly than if I brew right now. So I'm actually gonna try to do this while I'm talking. <laughs> um, just a side note, you might see me doing um, some technique stuff here with the brewer. Again, don't worry about techniques too much uh, of, of individual um, coffee brewing methods. Like I said, this is, uh oh, this is the Kalita wave. Oh, pardon me. I've made myself a clumsy situation and knocked my camera. All right, so let's get this. I've got 25 grams here, and then we're just gonna brew it. Nothing really fancier than that. Uh, this is one of the nice things about the fundamentals is when you get them down, um, the techniques are not all that important. Of course, it would help for me to turn my scale on. Okay, so as I said, once you grind the coffee, it starts to break down significantly. And what you're losing is amount of vibrancy. Uh, so my colleague and I, we actually did a, a test on this. We um, ground coffee a few days before and then a day before and then hours before and then minutes before and then right after brewing, we compared them all. Um, we discovered that there's a steep drop off, even just, as I said, 10 to 15 minutes uh, before brewing. And then it kind of plateaus after about a day, but you lose a significant amount of vibrant flavor. So if you are interested at all in enjoying the craft of coffee, getting into the, the flavors that you can find, um, exploring different coffees from around the world, uh, I believe that you really need to be doing this step. You really need to be grinding right before you brew. The controversy comes in the quality of the grind. So um, I have a note here that what you really want to be doing to grind your own coffee is get some kind of burr grinder. When I started off, I used a, ha I used a hand grinder, just a, just a manual hand grinder. Um, very effective. That works great. Uh, I did, of course, get tired of <laughs> manually grinding by hand after a while and got an electric burr grinder. Um, but I like to take the recommendation, if you don't have a grinder at home, get 
any kind of burr grinder, whether it's a hand grinder, it's an electric grinder. Uh, if you really get into it, you're probably going to want to up, upgrade your grinder uh, because the quality of the grind does matter. Uh, and here's just really quick uh, burr versus blade grinder. Um, Blade grinder is like a food processor, it literally chops the beans up and you get all sorts of different sizes and shapes, slivers to dust. And if you think about what I was talking about, coffee uh, brewing is an extraction. It's water interacting with the grounds to extract soluble compounds. Well, it's the surface area of all that that matters. So you can imagine water interacting with a large piece of, of coffee ground versus dust is going to extract uh, at vastly different rates, possibly different components as well. So what we try to do with our grind is get it as uniform as possible. The picture there on the screen is a pretty decent Burr coffee grinder. The one I have behind me, actually, this is a, a Breville. I think it's like a $200 range. The, the coffee grinders in the $200 range are, are conical Burr coffee grinders. You can um, look those up again. That's uh, one of those... <laughs> one of those rabbit holes that you can go down forever uh, on coffee. Um, but that's, that's kind of the ideal goal. So the alternate point of view to grinding fresh is, is getting the coffee pre-ground by a uh, professional, uh, by, by the roaster, by the cafe, because they have really expensive high-end uh, grinders that, that grind the coffee super evenly. Um, however, I'm just going to switch back to brewing here while I talk. However, I have found that um, the right, talking and pouring at the same time is apparently a challenge. I found that losing out on the vibrancy and the, and the practice of doing this yourself is such a great loss. You want to get into the craft of coffee and the enjoyment of it. Well, embrace the craft, embrace doing this whole process yourself, the ritual. And, and so I, I highly encourage uh, taking that step. I believe it is very important to, um, you know, get to grinding your coffee before your brew. All right. And the last, the number four most important thing, I think is actually the most important thing. This is actually your water. Uh, this might sound strange if you haven't heard of this before, but um, it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. The Water that you use to brew is of very, very critical importance. Again, go back to, as I was talking about how coffee is, is brewed, the water is interacting with the, com is, is trying to extract the soluble compounds. Well, it's the structure of the water that makes that possible. It's the minerals in the water. So there's actually a, a measurable specific range of mineral balances, hardness and softness, that is ideal if you wanna get into the weeds of, of um, coffee enthusiasm of craft specialty coffee. There's, a, there's an ideal amount, uh, a measurable amount of those things. So I'm not advocating necessarily for doing that, but it is very important to think about the quality of your water. To give you an anecdote, um, visited uh, my brother a couple years ago who lives in Ohio. The water that they have in, uh, like just naturally coming to their house, very poor. So they actually have to uh, heavily filter and soften their water as it comes into the house. Now, I had been trying to get them to kind of bump up the level of their coffee consumption for a while, but they always had kind of challenges in, in brewing it. And so when I visited, I said, okay, well, let me, let me troubleshoot. Let me help you figure out how to brew hand to hand. Um, I, and I, so I brought coffee with me that I was familiar with, brewed it on their equipment and discovered it significantly lacking in a lot of the uh, depth and richness that the coffee was able to have. And this is because their water was so filtered, it was unable to extract everything. If you go to the extreme level, you can, if you try brewing with distilled water, if you want to do this experiment, it's a gross result. The, the end result, you do get something out of it, but it's really sour and, and not enjoyable. Um, so water needs to have minerals in it. It needs to have something uh, to interact and it needs to have a certain balance. What I always recommend people is at least filter your water, but that again is going to depend on where you are, the quality of the water that you're starting to work with. Um, there are also other uh, like intricate situations. For instance, uh, I'm in an apartment right now. This building 
heavily chlorinates its water. And I have to, at the very least, filter it. Uh, but and sometimes I've had problem with that. So I started actually crafting my water, uh, which I've done before, but I've always been like kind of too lazy to do it. But this is, that, this is the extreme level is crafting your water. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, the other recommendation that I have, aside from filtering, and you may want to do this anyways, is to, at the very least, go to the store and get some simple bottled spring water. It doesn't have anything added to it. It's just regular bottled spring water and try brewing with that. I've, I've tried a number of brands of just typical spring water and it all generally works pretty well to brew a good cup of coffee. So you can compare that to the water that you usually use and see what kind of difference that you have. Uh, if you see no difference, then you might be good just going with what you usually use. Um, but that is like a really simple, easy way to get a good baseline uh, for the water that you brew with. Um, so there, it's just it's this Goldilocks zone of what the water needs to be to brew a really good cup of coffee, and you can have a fairly wide range of it. But if it if you have too little minerals or too many minerals or other things like chlorine or fluoride, for example, um, you're going to end up having issues brewing coffee if you're trying to brew uh, a really a really excellent brew to explore a lot of different flavors. So that last level that I mentioned, the um, crafting your own water. This is like this is like super nerd level of of <laughs> of coffee brewing, but it's actually really kind of interesting. Uh, the the short of it is you get distilled water and then you add measured amounts of um, uh, baking soda and Epsom salt essentially to create the structure of water that is ideal for brewing coffee, and. <clears throat> That's actually pretty easy to do if you get a basic recipe. Uh, you can just repeatedly do that and have really good good uh, water available for brewing all the time. But some people get super into it and, and craft waters for specific coffees and for specific brewing methods. I've never actually gotten to that level, uh, but it is, is kind of intriguing. I've seen some... Um, Gosh, there's a there's a roaster cafe in in the Bay Area, I believe, that does this. It might be Sight Glass, I can't remember, um, but they uh, have have gone to the extent of crafting water for specific coffees, um, which is which is pretty intriguing. Uh, but so that's a pretty that's a pretty high level. But at the very least, filter your water and and try out some bottled spring water to see how that compares to what you're doing. Uh, the last one I mentioned there, there are some products that essentially make the crafting of your coffee easier. Um, third wave water is the one I'm familiar with. Uh, you essentially get packets that you add to distilled water and it creates the right balance. Um, so that, I know all that sounds like really nerdy, but it is super, super, super important, the quality of your water and brewing. It's like, this actually should be number one, but it's, it's, hard, to, um, it's hard to connect with people on that, on that level, honestly, when you're just getting into the, to the brewing of really good coffee at home. Um, so that's, those are the four core fundamentals. So if you master those, uh, measure your coffee by weight, uh, grams. And, and as you noticed, <clears throat> uh, as I was brewing the coffee, let me go back over here. I just did everything on the scale. So I added uh, 25 grams of coffee here, and then I brewed with the approximately 400 grams of water. Um, I, I usually kind of fudge it because I'm lazy, but uh, you know, getting it close enough is good. And that's, that's really all it is, whether you're doing a pour over method like this, or you're doing a French press. If you're doing a French press, you would just add that amount of coffee and water to the thing and then wait four minutes. Uh, very simple. Get fresh coffee, fresh roasted coffee that's been roasted within a week. Uh, grind it right before you brew, and then pay attention to the quality of your water. Those four things, you can play around with those, um, and that covers everything. So I, uh, I realized I skimmed over slightly espresso. This is where I was going to do an espresso demonstration. Let me just quickly talk about the ratios for espresso, because uh, in, in the industry, it's, it's talked about a little differently. It's not the ratio of coffee, ground coffee to water that you're using during the brew, it's the ratio of ground coffee in to espresso out. Uh, so that's typically what's done is, is the amount of coffee that's got, that is put in, amount of coffee that's put into the portafilter. Is that me on the screen? Yeah, so the amount of coffee that's put into the portafilter and then the amount of coffee, amount of espresso that you get out in the cup. That is what's measured. And usually it's uh, one, 
one to two or one to three. Those are like kind of some common ratios that are used for just straight up espresso or espresso that's used in, in drinks. Uh, so on the machine here, and if we have time at the end, I can do this. What I would do is I would add 18 grams of coffee to this, and then I would expect 36 grams of, of espresso in here. So that's, that's kind of the ratio approach with espresso. All right, uh, let me get to the questions because there are a good amount. Um, and again, feel free, please uh, uh, add your questions to, to the chat if you have any, um, we'll cover them as well. So these are all from, from folks who submitted questions in the survey uh, that I provided. Okay, first one is coffee good or bad for your health? Uh, <clears throat> so this is actually um, a kind of a challenging subject sometimes because uh, there's actually rather minimal research done on coffee and its effects on health. Uh, all the research that I've seen, uh, all the positive research that I've seen is, is based around um, filtered coffee like this with nothing else added to it. So uh, as, far as, I, as far as I've seen in the research, and, and this is just like, you can, you can dig up um, all sorts of research papers online uh, about the different benefits of coffee to your health. But everything that I've seen points to uh, brewed coffee with nothing added being very good for you. Obviously, if you add milk to it, then you're drinking a bunch of milk or, or sugar. You know, you have to consider those, but you can, you know, think about those as like separate elements. Are you going to add a bunch of sugar to your coffee? Then you're drinking a bunch of sugar. Is that good for you? Uh, it's up to you to decide. The caffeine, uh, you can consider separately. So I, I certainly have seen people talk uh, in terms of the health of coffee that the, the benefits exist whether there's caffeine or not. So if you have decaf coffee, um, you still get the, the whatever health benefits there are uh, related to it. Um, so caffeine itself is, of course, another subject, and that depends entirely on how the coffee affects you, uh, how the caffeine affects you. So that's something that... Um, I can't answer that question for you. Personally, um, th there, there are a couple of other nuances as well. Uh, paper filtered coffee has less coffee oils. Um, immersion coffee, like a French press, uh, has a lot more oil in it. And there are studies which show a correlation between uh, two key uh, uh, diapertines, I think they're called, a uh, caffeol and caweol in coffee which are filtered out by paper, but they're in French press, uh, especially, there's a correlation between the consumption of those and a rise in, I believe it's LDL cholesterol. So um, I've seen a number of papers uh, reference and, and, and show that correlation. So that's something to consider. I don't think it's anything that, that most people need to be worried about. Personally, I actually just notice I feel better drinking paper filtered coffee. So that's what I like. I like the taste, I feel better. So that's what I do. Um, oh, and uh, espresso has the same uh, existence of oils because there's no real filtering of espresso. Uh, so consider that. Okay. Uh, how long does caffeine effect last in the body? Um, I have read uh, that caffeine has like an eight hour half-life, but I think it depends entirely on you. Um, personally, I try not to drink coffee afternoon. I find as long as I keep my coffee consumption to the morning, I don't really have any sleep problems. But especially if I start, if I drink coffee around three, I typically have issues uh, sleeping. So um, it's, a, it's a your mileage may vary kind of question. Okay, what are the different ways to brew and what differences do they make? This is, this is a broad question. I'm going to show you a few different things. Uh, of course, I, I've shown the um, Kalita wave here, which is a pour over brew method. It's, it's called the wave because Oh, let me switch back to the other camera here. Okay, it's called the wave because the filter is waved. Very clever. It's also a flat bottom uh, pour over dripper so that the, the bottom of it is flat compared to, this is a V60 brewer. In the V60 brewer, the filters come to a point uh, so this is a this is a round cone dripper. Uh, as another example, of course, we had the French press, which we talked about. Um, Y'all are probably familiar with the French press and Aeropress, 
is another example. So this is a very intriguing, you know, could do an entire webinar just on the AeroPress. There are about a thousand and one different ways to brew with this thing, uh, but it typically, it, it uses pressure in one way or the other, essentially. Um, I do it this way? Okay, yeah. So ground coffee in, water in, and then you press it out with the plunger. So, and of course there's espresso. There's, there's, like I said, a lot of different ways to brew coffee. The fundamentals apply to all of them. The differences that they make are um, noticeable, very noticeable if you get into the craft of it. Uh, I like, for example, the Kalita Wave. Let's compare the Kalita Wave versus the uh, V60. These are two very popular um, pour over drip methods that are quite similar. The uh, Kalita Wave for me tends to uh, have a richer taste result. Um, the, the, the water sits with the coffee a little bit longer, the flow is restricted, um, and, and there are a few other things going on with the, the kind of the wave filter and the flat bottom compared to the V60 where the flow is much faster. Uh, the V60 tends to have a crisper, you could argue cleaner brew. So it depends on what your preference is as to what you wanna do in, in terms of coffee brewing. My advice is explore all of them. <laughs> I like the V60 because the brewing is simple. So I don't really have to think about it in the morning, or sorry, the Kalita Wave. I like the Kalita Wave because the brewing is simple. I don't have to think about it in the morning. The V60, uh, can be a little finicky. Uh, if you get a good practice with it, a, a good um, method down, it can be really good. The thing about the V60 is that, um, there we go. That's a very large uh, hole at the bottom. It, it does not restrict the flow at all. So the flow of the coffee through there depends on a number of factors, including uh, grind size, freshness of the coffee, uh, how you pour the water, all these sorts of things. So um, you can, you can end up, at least I, I tend to end up with inconsistencies in my V60. Uh, and I just, I just like the Kalita wave and the result it gives me, plus I'm lazy. So uh, it works for me. Um, okay, hopefully, uh, let me know if you want any, uh, have any more questions about that kind of thing. Again, I could think a webinar could be done on every single one of these brew methods. Um, benefits of brewing your own coffee versus other options. Uh, the enjoyment of brewing your own coffee um, the ability to explore a lot of different coffees. Of course, if you're brewing your own coffee, you can go to any roaster and get their coffee and brew it however you wish. Uh, brewing your own coffee, you can get a wide selection of brewers and, and try things in different ways. Uh, I think brewing your own coffee takes you as close to the coffee as possible. Uh, one of the things that you may have, have gleaned from everything that I've shared is the immense amount of people involved and creating a cup of coffee. Hundreds of hands and thousands of miles go into creating this cup of coffee. Uh, what I brewed here, um, I actually didn't mention this, but was in the, um, the coffee airscape there, which I can talk about in a moment. This is a, uh, one second, oh, yeah, it's me here. So this coffee is from the Congo. Uh, it's roasted by Conduit Coffee Roasters, one of my favorites around here. Uh, if you visit the, the URL there, there's a link to Conduit Coffee so you can check them out. Uh, I don't think he has any more of the Congo. Uh, but so this coffee is from a, a woman's cooperative in the Congo. So that it's, it's really fascinating to me to be kind of a part of that creation and experience that, you know, I get to do that by, by brewing it here. That's something that you only get by brewing the coffee yourself. So to me, those are like really fascinating uh, aspects of coffee that I really enjoy. Uh, what is the best cup to use? Okay, this is actually pretty cool. Um, oh, that's good. So first of all, there's no best cup to use, but uh, I have to show you this because this is really cool. The cup you use does influence the taste of the coffee. Uh, and I'm gonna pull this on the, uh, let's do this here, okay. So this is a coffee tasting cup set by Espro, E-S-P-R-O. So you can go check out their website and look it up. Uh, the idea is each of, these, each of these cups is created in a way to accentuate different flavors. This is the, uh, it's not really focusing there, but this is to accentuate fruit, this one. This is to accentuate cocoa. Uh, this one I think is the 
floral. Yeah, that's the floral one. And this one is the spice. So if you take uh, one coffee, so if you take one coffee and brew it uh, and put it in each, like if I took this coffee and poured it into each of these, it would taste different in each cup. I'm not even kidding. It's very, it's noticeable and it's wild and it's really cool. So the shape of the cup influences how your coffee tastes. And the only way to figure that out is to experiment. So I actually, I own a wide variety of different kinds of mugs, you know, from standard kind of, uh, you know, your typical coffee mug to I've got, you know, this kind of kind of curved mug is, is really good. I, I kind of like this sort of shape typically for my coffee mugs. Um, the, the tastes in coffee that I enjoy the most are like rich chocolate, rich fruit. Um, one thing I haven't even gotten into on, on this webinar is the differences between coffee processing, uh, which will probably have to be another one or I can answer that question if anyone would like. Um, so there is no best cup, but the cup affects the flavor. So try every mug that you have and see if you like one better than the other. There's also just the joy of, of um, the mug itself. I have, a, I have a mug that's somewhat like this shape, uh, but it's, it's a handcrafted mug with some etching on the side. Um, I really enjoy coffee out of that just because I love the mug. Uh, so that's, a, that's not an insignificant factor. It's something to think about. Um, the best coffee to use, again, Flat answer, no best coffee. Real answer, I believe the best coffee to use is the one that you can get from hands directly. So find a local roaster, get to know them, drink their coffee. That is the best coffee. And then especially if that roaster has taken steps to know where that coffee comes from, if they're sourcing from places that, that you know, the closer you can get your hands to the hands that have created the coffee, the better the coffee. That is my point of view, uh, my personal opinion, but I heartily believe in that. Okay, best brewing device, best method to brew coffee. Um, this is similar to the other ones and it's personal preference. I've spoken a little bit about what I, what I like um, in terms of the Kalita Wave. Uh, I actually recommend for anyone, if you are not brewing your own coffee at home right now and you want to get into it, just get yourself a French press. It doesn't have to be uh, like fancy. This is a double wall steel. This is an, actually an Espro, the same company that makes the mugs. Um, I really like this one because, pardon me, it has a double filter in it, uh, which is, it, it suits my taste. Um, but just any old French press will do. That will help you focus on the fundamentals of brewing good coffee well. Uh, and that's what I recommend. But from there, if you get into it, and you like the craft of it, start exploring. Uh, you want to get into a pour over, I do highly recommend the Kalita Wave because it's easy to get started. If you want to get into the intricacies of brewing, uh, go with a V60. You can get a Chemex. These are all like really beautiful ways to make coffee. Um, there are also tools like a really nice um, gooseneck kettle, which makes it much easier to pour. So um, these are all things to, to consider. Uh, recommended places to appreciate coffee. Oh, yes. Uh, so this question came from this is this is a hard question to answer just straight up this came from uh david i think who wanted to know about barcelona so i don't i don't know barcelona and i don't know anyone who lives in barcelona but what i wanted to share was kind of the way that i look for coffee when i go to a new place and uh, honestly what i do is i i do a google search for coffee city and then I look at the ratings and I also look at pictures. You can kind of tell, in some cases you can really tell, uh, the, the number one search I, I found for Coffee Barcelona, uh, there are a lot of pictures of really excellently poured latte art. If you find a cafe that's doing really good latte art, they uh, put a lot into their barista training and education, and it's highly likely that they have really good coffee. Uh, but that's how I do it. I, I look for those kinds of places and I start exploring. I find if they have coffee that I enjoy the taste of, um, there's a whole rabbit hole to go down in, in, in terms of determining if a cafe or a roaster has good coffee, uh, but that, that would have to be for another time. Hopefully that's, that's helpful. Um, you can also search like coffee roasters, hopefully try to find a local coffee roaster, um, but uh, that's, a, that's a good way to start. 
Oh, best milk foaming techniques. I actually, I, I included this because uh, you asked, but I, um, I am not, I'm not an expert at espresso. I actually almost never drink coffee with milk. Uh, I do on occasion just as an enjoyment, but I don't tend, tend to like feel good <laughs> drinking a lot of that coffee. Uh, and I usually use uh, not, um, not like, uh, I actually tend to like oat milk these days, uh, but non-cow based milks, non-dairy based milks. Uh, but I did want to mention that the fattier the milk is, the better it foams. So that's something to keep in mind on Hopefully that is helpful for this uh, sort of thing. Uh, and also I should say, I do have an espresso machine. I do film mocha on it, uh, but th this is, um, I can't really show it the way the camera is. Maybe that comes up. It's the Breville Bambino. Uh, so the Breville, the new, their newest espresso machines have such a sophisticated milk steaming mechanism that you can get cafe quality milk steaming by just sticking the pitcher in there and turning it on. Uh, that's not an exaggeration. Uh, had a had an owner of a cafe come in and, and try it out. And he was like, this is going to put my baristas out of business, uh, which is really funny. Okay. Anything you can do different with espresso to make more uh, fantastic coffee? Uh, my answer to that is to explore, uh, try new things, uh, try coffees you haven't tried before, try coffees from different origins. Um, in terms of, of tools and techniques, usually the answer is upgrading your grinder the most important thing when it comes to um, really getting into espresso is the grind size because uh, when it comes to like dialing in and exploring coffee with espresso, the fineness of the grind and making those adjustments is what is, is critical. Uh, this grinder that I have here, it's like kind of $200, is basically an entry-level espresso grinder. I can do espresso fine on it. It works well enough for me. I don't drink a lot of espresso, just every now and then kind of enjoy it. If I was going to really get into uh, espresso. The machine I have is great for it. I would upgrade my grinder. I would bump up. I would look at like $400, $600 level range of, of grinders and really get into the quality of my grinder, the quality of the grind and the ability to minutely adjust the grind size. That's um, one of the most critical aspects from espresso point of view. Okay. Any particular method of brewing that is more suited to each coffee type? Uh, possibly you can, you can explore this. I actually, I, I thought about it this way for a while and then I decided maybe not, maybe not necessarily. Um, I have, I have found that if I'm brewing a really uh, darkly roasted coffee, I don't really like darkly roasted coffees, but if I have one and I want to brew it, there's two things that I'll do. First, I'll brew at a lower temperature. Uh, it's something I didn't talk about in the, in the fundamentals, which I probably should have mentioned <laughs> in the water section, is uh, you want your water to be hot, especially if you're brewing like lighter or medium roasted coffees. If you're brewing darker roasted coffees, you want the temperature a little lower. Um, and that range is, is for medium and lighter roasted coffees, you want it uh, about 205, 208. But you're brewing at home, like on a pour over or something like that, just bring your water to the boil and then brew it. That's fine. Uh, if you're brewing a dark roasted coffee, you can drop the temperature down uh, a range of like 190 to 195. That actually prevents you from extracting some of the compounds which have become uh, caustic and unenjoyable during uh, the roasting process when it's roasted darker. So two hacks for dark roasted coffee, brew at the lower temperature. Second, I actually like to brew on the Chemex because the Chemex filter is very thick and filters out a lot of undesirable things. Um, but some people might argue for a medium and darker roasted coffee, you want to go with the French press because the French press will bring out a lot more of the lipids and those caramelized sugars that are in the, um, that are apparent in a darker roast. So again, it's kind of a, a taste perspective thing. Uh, try different things out and, and see if you, see if you like them. And don't be afraid to get a large collection of coffee brewers. It's a lot of fun. All right, how much impact does the origin of coffee have on the final flavor? Uh, incredible, incredible impact. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just taking a look at the questions. Am I going too long here? Is this all right? I know we're kind of at an hour here and, and I'm almost through the initial questions and then I wanted to hopefully answer some of your questions in there. Uh, and then I actually, I, I'm good to stay on for quite a while if, if some of you wanna hang around, we can, we can do some espresso possibly. Okay, how much impact does the origin of coffee have on the final flavor? Uh, huge, tremendous. Uh, it is, um, 
it is it is very really uh, although i should say really it comes down to the terroir uh which you know essentially what is the soil that it's grown in um and how is it processed origin Origin actually kind of means a lot of things, I guess, now that I'm kind of thinking about it a little bit more. Uh, for some people, origin is all the way to, all the, way to the farm. Uh, for others, it's a region, maybe it's a, um, a processing station. When, when origin is referenced on a roasted coffee, um, coffee roasters tend to go as specific as they can, but sometimes they can't get more specific than a region or a country. Uh, but the more specific you can get, the more that matters to the end result. Uh, I have seen uh, larger coffee estates where they grow the same coffee in different areas and it tastes different depending on the area and the coffee estate that they grow. So everything involving the, the growing and processing and creation of coffee impacts the final flavor, including the origin. Uh, again, that's like an entire webinar on its own. Do I like to add ingredients to lift the taste of coffee like raw cocoa nibs? Uh, I almost, so in terms of brewing coffee itself, I almost never add anything. I almost never add anything afterwards. I almost never add anything during the brew. Sometimes I like to experiment. Uh, one thing that I found to be particularly fun with cold brew is to cold brew with raw cocoa nibs uh, because you can cold brew raw cocoa and create a really interesting drink and you can do the two together and create like a cocoa cold brew that is really delicious. I learned this from uh, a local uh, chocolatier here, uh, Intrigue Chocolates, he does this it's really fascinating, really delicious. And so I like to do that sometimes. Um, it's just, uh, it's, uh, it can be a little, little bit of a challenge. You want to get the, um, the cocoa grind size uh, correct. And that's hard to do without, like you don't wanna put that through your coffee grinder because that'll like kind of, you know, coat your coffee grinder in chocolate. So anyway, that's an interesting thing to do. Uh, other places, adding cardamom to coffee, uh, very popular. So that's, um, that's an interesting combination. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of other ways to experiment with that kind of thing. I typically don't, I just like having the coffee in its, I guess, purest form. Uh, but again, sometimes experimenting is fun. Okay. Uh, I think this might be uh, close to the last one. Where do I find and buy the best espresso beans for home brewing? What is the best way to brew espresso by hand or with machine? Um, so the, the answer to buying uh, espresso, any coffee can be used in espresso. They, roasters have like an espresso roast and it's typically um, a, a roast that is, uh, a roast that is designed with the espresso process in mind. Because what's happening with espresso and brew that's, di that's different from just regular brewed is, you, you still have the water in the grounds, but then immense pressure is applied to forcefully extract um, oils and acids and everything. So that, uh, that dynamic is vastly different from regular brewing. And so what a lot of roasters will do is they will create a blend that is made with that process in mind. Uh, so they will, they will, you know, taste test their espresso brew with espresso to determine, okay, yes, that's what I want. The other aspect that happens with espresso blends is they're often created in mind with the, the likely notion that that espresso will be added to a milk drink. Most espresso is created for milk-based drinks. And when you start adding milk and, and coffee together, uh, you have some interesting interactions going on. You, this is typically why um, darker roast is used a lot in espresso because it communicates through milk a lot better. Uh, you can easily, if you have a lighter roast, you can easily drown out the taste of the coffee with the milk. And sometimes a lighter roast and milk can combine to be sour. That being said, if you're just doing espresso, you can use any coffee that you like. It's a really fun way to explore coffee uh, differently, which is why I have an espresso machine. I like to every now and then try a coffee that I'm enjoying as brew as espresso to see, you know, what is this like? Can I taste anything different? Um, so that's, that's really enjoyable. And the best way to brew espresso by hand or with machine, uh, technically with machine, uh, just because the mechanics that go into creating a really good espresso uh, require a lot of consistency of temperature and pressure. And that's something that is, is nearly impossible to do with, with a hand um, with a hand espresso machine. Uh, that being said, you can get really good espressos by hand uh, or really good approximations of espressos. Uh, I've done 
um, a pretty decent espresso with an AeroPress. You know, it doesn't really necessarily compare to the espresso machine, uh, but it's an enjoyable, uh, you might argue espresso-like beverage, but I think you can get pretty close with a lot of pressure with the AeroPress. I've also used some other uh, like hand pump machines uh, that, can, that can create a, a pretty good espresso. The problem they have is temperature consistency. Uh, kind of the same with the AeroPress. Uh, the difference is um, with the AeroPress, I think I've been able to extract at enough speed that the water doesn't tank in pressure too much, but I honestly haven't played around with it too much. So honestly, machine is the best. Um, okay, so that's the end of the questions I have here. I have one more that was asked uh, just before um, I pulled this up on the, on the survey, just before we went live, and I wanted to go through it since it was asked there. Uh, my main question is whether you can or should freeze coffee beans. It seems the opinions on this are split. I've done both and frankly do not detect much difference in the taste, but the unfrozen beans do not last too long. What is your experience? Um, so I talked about uh, the freshness of coffee and how that, that goes over a month period. Um, my advice is always if you buy coffee and you don't expect to touch it for over a month, then you might think about freezing it. And you might think about freezing it in quantities which you are going to consume within a week. Because if you freeze coffee, you don't want to like unfreeze it and refreeze it. You don't want to be taking it in and out of the freezer. You can freeze it in a sealed container. And then when you take it out of the freezer, wait for it to come to room temperature before opening it. And this is actually a very fantastic way to preserve roasted coffee. Because you'll find when you, when you take that out, it brews very close to how it was when you froze it. But what I also have found is that breakdown that breaks down very fast after that point. So um, I don't know exactly what's going on there chemically, uh, but it is, it is rather interesting. So if you want to get into that, if you find yourself getting a lot of extra coffee that you're not going to consume, you know, within a month time frame, uh, you might consider getting uh, like a, uh, what are those like air sealer bag things, like vacuum sealer bag things, and then do that in, in batches of coffee that you would consume within a week or a few days. And then, you know, take those out a few days ahead of time, you know, open it and then try to consume that as fast as possible and do a rotation that way. One thing I like to do, because uh, I, I try to get coffee um, that I'm going to consume within the next week or two, if if I have coffee that I'm not going to touch for a while, so I actually, um, this is an example of the Congo. I got like a five pound bag of that Congo because I think it was, uh, Jesse's the owner of Condo Coffee. I think it was his last batch and I really wanted a lot extra. So I threw, um, I think this holds a little over a pound. I threw a little over a pound of it in here. This is just a, you know, a, an opaque airtight, you know, I can push out the air uh, kind of sealer. It's called the Airscape. I find this really nice. Um, I use this for anything that I'm not going to consume. Basically, I don't expect to touch for a while, a couple of weeks, sometimes over a month. I think this is actually over a month and it still tastes really good. So this is, this is another good option as well, getting something like this. Um, another comparable solution is, uh, I'm going to get really into coffee storage here. Um, <laughs> we, Jesse and I got really nerdy about this. Um, we did a whole test, discovered the most damaging thing to coffee is light followed, well, water. <laughs> Moisture actually is the most damaging, but we're considering storage options where you don't get that. So the most damaging thing is light uh, followed by oxygen. So having an opaque container like this will keep the light off your coffee. Uh, what I've also done is I've taken a mason jar and I've just black taped it so that no light gets in and that works similarly to this. Uh, but if you have a, a coffee bag, for example, this one's from Porta Mocha. Um, another good, uh, actually <laughs> highly recommend trying this out. I put a link to them on the page, uh, the um, extractedmagazine.com slash ASW. This is a Yemeni coffee. Check out their subscriptions. It's a lot more than you probably paid for coffee but it's very, 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 very worth it. Very worth it. Definitely do like at least one, try it out. It's very um, delicious, intriguing coffee. Uh, oh, but yes. Yeah, so if you have a, have a, a bag like this, which is sealed, um, you can just leave the coffee in the bag. Uh, this is a fine way to store coffee for, you know, a few weeks that works. Um, if it's in a paper bag, uh, <clears throat> Conduit Coffee Roasters uh, likes to go minimal on their packaging. So if I'm going to have some of their coffee, either I, 
and I'm not going to have it for a while. Either I put it in the Airscape or I take the paper bag and I put it in a Ziploc and that works as well. So um, those are a bunch of options. I hope that answers the uh, freezing question. Um, one more question here. Why is coffee at a coffee shop so much better generally than homebrewed coffee, even using decent machines? Um, I never use capsules, but I always grind whole. Uh, so <clears throat> the short answer is because they are, are trained and they have um, processes set up to uh, repeatedly create consistently delicious coffee. That is, that is the main answer to that. They also um, uh, do things like uh, oftentimes cafes, especially specialty cafes, will craft their water or, or filter it in a very specific way to get exactly the right kind of water that they need for brewing. Um, so that's an important thing to pay attention to. All right. That is um, all of the uh, questions I had from the, uh, from the survey there. Let me start going through the, the chat here and see what we can uh, come up with. Um, let's see. So can, should milk be added, uh, Akos? Uh, that's to your taste, really. You can. Uh, sometimes, especially with espresso, um, if I do have milk with an espresso, I will go for uh, a very small milk-based drink, like cappuccino at the largest, um, or, or flat white style cappuccino, if you will. Uh, but I actually like them a lot smaller these days. Uh, Italiano, I think, is, is possibly the right right, phrasing essentially about four ounces between the espresso and the milk, because the milk really, really kind of pulls out the flavors in an interesting way. Uh, so it, it just, it's a different experience if you, you know, if you enjoy exploring coffee as I do, so that can, that can be fun. Um, a word about Nescafe, uh, not sure what you, uh, asking about that, if you can, if you can clarify. Uh, I can get into that. Which of the coffee chains is the chains is the best in your expert opinion? I don't like the coffee chains. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to be shy about saying that. Um, I like to get closer to the coffee. I like to m talk to the roasters in person. I like to know that the hands have, ha like my hands can be as close to the hands that created it as possible. I think that is one of the best things that you can do. Uh, so that is, um, that is what I support. Uh, and, and I highly recommend, um, highly recommend that to anyone. Okay. Do, uh, you have a recommendation on a good coffee and sorry about that. I mean, like, <laughs> I know coffee chains are everywhere, but, um, I, I hope, did I gloss over that? I don't want to be like a, a dismissive or like really snooty. <laughs> um, I think, I think most of the coffee chains, honestly, as far as taste of coffee goes, makes decent coffee. Um, but I'm really, I'm really passionate about getting as close to the people as possible um, because it's, it's such a, a people-centered, human-centered thing. And the further away you get from that, I think the, the worse we all are. Uh, that's, that's the same way I feel about uh, pod coffee machines, for example. I think that removes you so much from, from coffee, you know, never mind the waste involved. But um, okay. Do you have a recommendation on a good coffee brewer that's also easy to clean? We have a culinary pour over coffee maker that makes excellent coffee, but the cleanup is atrocious. Um, easy to clean. I mean, that's one of the reasons, if you're talking hand brewers, that's one of the reasons I like uh, brewers like the Kalita Wave, uh, the V60, the Chemex, uh, your cleanup process for that is take the filter out, throw it away, rinse out the brewer, you're done. Uh, every now and then, you know, you want to clean for um, a buildup of coffee. If you're talking uh, automated coffee brewers, first off, I didn't talk about automated coffee brewers on this at all. There are actually really good automated coffee brewers for exploring craft specialty coffee. Um, the Specialty Coffee Association has a, a certification, a rating system for coffee brewers, and you can kind of Google that, uh, SCA certified brewers. Those all um, have essentially, the, the key component to them is the quality of the materials so they don't break down and they're consistent with their temperature, which is where most other coffee, like automated coffee brewers fail. So those are all good, but they all like, for example, um, this guy, this is uh, the Breville brewer is really fantastic. One of the things that bugs me about it 
I'm not sure I can show it on the screen, but there's this like lip on the inside that gets like kind of collects grime. Um, that's really, really kind of annoying to clean, but um, you know, soap and water for the most part cleans the inside. After a certain amount of brews, I will use some good old uh, kafiza to clean any um, sort of coffee buildup. This is good on pretty much any machines, any brewer, you know, toss it in there. But uh, for, for things like, uh, honestly, things like the Chemex, the Kalita Wave, the V60, those pour over brewers, you can clean with soap and water and, and they, they clean really easily. Um, please talk a little bit about roast level and your personal preference. Uh, yeah, so I tend to, I tend to, exist in the realm of lighter roasted coffees. The lighter the coffee roast, the more you can taste the origin of the coffee, um, the more you can taste kind of intricate, delicate flavors. So this, this Congo coffee, let me see. I get some like lemons and melon. A little bit of spice. There's a lot of melon, melon flavor to this coffee. It's really interesting. But if this coffee is roasted a lot darker, that would disappear. That would not be there, uh, which would, to my mind, be quite unfortunate. Um, so I tend to like lighter roasted coffees. The, once you get into medium, medium can also be really good because the, the more you roast, the more you caramelize the sugar in the coffee. So the more like uh, sweetness you pull out in the brew, but it's, it's a balance. Like the more you caramelize, the more you roast out the delicate flavors that are um, from the origin, from the growing and the processing of the coffee. You get into darker roasted coffee, it's just caramelized sugars or burnt sugars and oils. Uh, and that's really not, not my interest at all. Minimizing stained teeth. So uh, that's an interesting one. I, uh, when I went to the dentist recently, the dentist commented, um, well, I see you don't drink coffee. That's really good. And I laughed considering my uh, profession. Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly. It might be a paper filter thing. Um, like maybe, maybe paper filtered coffee takes out a lot of the oils or thicker paper filters. Uh, the, the paper filters that you use in like a hand pour over tend to be thicker than used in an auto drip machine, for example. It might be lighter roasted coffees. It might be that staining happens because of um, uh, some caramelization or burnt that happens in uh, the darker roasts. I don't actually know this is just my hypothesis. So I don't know if that, that'll be um, of interest to you. Any comments on Greek coffee? I don't know Greek coffee. So I'm sorry, I can't comment. Something for me to explore, it seems. Uh, does aging play a role similar to how alcohol aging for stronger content post crop state? So some people have started experimenting actually with aging, um, I guess not started, they've been doing it for a while, with aging the green coffee. Uh, every account that I have uh, seen of this coffee aging is that it's intriguing and rather uh, unenjoyable. <laughs> so I don't think that's ever really gonna be a thing. Um, it's far more likely, some, this is uh, popularized by George Howell, um, <clears throat> well-known in the coffee industry and a coffee roaster on the East Coast in Boston, uh, he freezes his green coffee because that preserves the green coffee for a very long time. So like anti-aging, essentially. So no, aging doesn't work the same with alcohol. Um, yeah, and if you, I mean, try brewing a coffee and then letting the brew sit around for a long time, I don't think you will enjoy the results. <laughs> All right. Um, are there professional coffee competitions? There absolutely are. Uh, it's huge in, in the coffee industry, especially coffee industry. I think it's difficult to um, get to from a consumer perspective unless you're in the circles. Coffee industry is really rather insular, um, but there are, there are a lot of competitions, uh, just broad barista competitions and kind of competitions for a lot of different brewing methods, uh, especially like espresso and AeroPress. Um, but it's, it's really big in the coffee industries. If you have a 
cafe who sends or roaster who sends baristas to competitions, they will often talk about it. So you, it, you know, if you get to know a local cafe or a local roaster, you might ask them if they get involved in competitions. That's a good way to kind of get into that. Do I make my living on your coffee, on my coffee expertise? Uh, pretty much. I do, I do a lot of other things, uh, entrepreneurial. So this is just one of the things that I do. Uh, but yeah, pretty much. I actually, um, I guess my approach is a bit unusual than most. I've never been a barista. Um, and I don't do that kind of work. I don't roast coffee either. Um, I just uh, publish all about coffee, uh, create a lot of content, connect stories and ideas and people. Uh, and uh, you know, found that really enjoyable and have been fortunate to um, go along doing that. So let's see. Well, glad you learned some tips, Sabrina. Ghirardelli coffee. You mean like uh, chocolate in coffee? Or does Ghirardelli make their own coffee? I suppose I could see that happening. Uh, the Italian Bialetti coffee makers. Are you talking, if you're talking like the mocha pots uh, that sit on the stove, those are really nice. And I think they have a number of different styles of those. I do, I do enjoy those. I, I had one for a while. I think um, I lost it a long while back. Um, might, might get another one. I don't know. I, again, I don't typically make an espresso style coffee, uh, but they are fun and they make a really um, intriguing experience because the, the coffee you get out of it tends to have more of a, I want to say like a roasty flavor. I think that's from the process of being brewed on the stove like that. So it's a, it's a unique experience and I certainly think it's worthwhile. Uh, difference between a cappuccino and a latte macchiato. Um, so, well, a latte macchiato. Okay. Let me talk cappuccino versus macchiato. So cappuccino, it, typically with all the milk-based espresso drinks, it's about the ratio from the espresso to the milk. So a cappuccino is a six ounce drink with uh, two ounces of espresso in it, four ounces of milk. And a classic cappuccino is steamed in a particular way. So the classic cappuccino with a really thick foam on it uh, will be steamed with thick foam, the milk will be poured, and then the milk uh, foam will be spooned on. Uh, what a lot of uh, specialty cafes are doing uh, and have been doing for a number of years is very similar to uh, the flat white, the Australian flat white, where the cappuccino will be topped with microfoam that is poured with art. So you can't do that when the foam is too thick. So the foam layer is thinner, but it's still about a six ounce beverage. A macchiato, a te technical macchiato is a shot of espresso with a spoon of foam on top. That is a technical macchiato. You go to a place like Starbucks that has a latte macchiato. Uh, what they're doing is they're creating a latte and the macchiato is marking. So macchiato is like uh, marked with milk. Uh, espresso marked with milk essentially is what that means. Um, so a Starbucks latte macchiato or caramel macchiato is a latte marked with caramel. So it's just a latte with caramel in it. And maybe they use thicker foam. I don't know. It's not really a macchiato. So I think they're, um, you know, they've just taken a lot of liberties with um, the words they use for marketing purposes. Okay. Uh, what, which espresso machine would I recommend. Oh, and just one more on the, the milk-based drink. So I mentioned uh, when I like milk-based drinks, I use uh, more like Italiano, which is like a four ounce drink. So again, it's, it's all about the ratio of espresso to milk. And, and you can kind of go all along the range of that. Um, something to explore. All right. So which espresso machine would I recommend? Um, this kind of brings us to, to espresso. Uh, and I see we still have Still have 23 people on here. Do you all want to see some espresso? Should I go into that? Uh, I have to change up my overhead camera here a little bit, but I can, I can make some espresso and talk a bit. Um, okay, cool. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change up my camera setting here for the espresso machine. And then in the meantime, I'm going to answer this uh, favorite roast level with a Bialetti. Um, I would probably go for a medium roast, to be honest. I don't use a, a Bialetti too much, so I, I, don't have, um, I don't have a whole lot of experience to really deeply answer that question. But um, 
I would probably go medium just because I think that particular brew process would benefit from having more caramelized sugar in the coffee. Uh, so I, m I mentioned this earlier, but um, there, there isn't really an espresso roast. Um, you, could, you could definitely actually take an espresso blend and try it with that. So the, the espresso blends being um, made by the roasters with the espresso process in mind. So they often have components that are that often like blended components of, of darker and lighter roasts, depending on the roaster. So you, you could certainly try that out. My, you know, I, I think my real answer to this is, is experiment and see what you like best because um, it, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just all personal preference. There's no reason you can't use any coffee that you want in uh, a mocha pot though, from you know, light to dark. All right, I'm just gonna shuffle some things around and try not to make a mess. I'm actually in the process of, of moving to a, a, a new studio office, which will be much better set up for brewing. This has been kind of cramped. Um, okay, one second. Crash, bang, boom. Uh, again, any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Sorry if I'm making a lot of loud noises. Let's see if I can get this in here like this. Hmm. And again, for, for those of you following along, um, I'm kind of to the end of the presentation. We're just going to have some fun here with espresso. Um, if you want to stick around with that, um, I'm going to just kind of try to show you my understanding. Uh, like I said, I'm not, um, I'm not a huge expert on espresso by any stretch of the imagination, but I do know a thing or two about a thing or two. So, hmm. How can I get this in here? I'm trying to, oh, I know what I can do. Hang on. Oh yeah, there we go. That's a good view. Okay. Hopefully my audio is still good. All right, I'll try that out, Christina. Thank you for the tip. Okay, um, gonna switch. All right, it's still working. Good, good, good. Hang on. All right, so I'm just gonna flip back to me here really quick. <laughs> okay, so I've got, <laughs> this uh, really silly setup here and uh, hopefully I can walk through it. But what I'm going to try to do is just tell you, I'm, I'm going to go through how I make an espresso, try to tell you what I understand about it. Um, and, uh, and hopefully it's, it's interesting. Uh, I'm actually, I'm going to use the, uh, I'm going to use this Porto Mocha coffee. I think I have about 18 grams left in here. Um, I've been doing this with uh, getting these bags for a while and I tend to have enough left after brewing uh, batches of, of 25 grams on the Kalita Wave. I tend to have about 18 left in here, which is great for an espresso. And it's really interesting. The thing about Yemen coffees, which, which you know, I had a lot more time to, to get into those, but um, Yemen coffee is the highest altitude coffee grown. Uh, very interesting, unique varietals, uh, really old old place to grow. It's also really dry, harsh climate. Uh, so the coffee trees have to have to work a whole lot to grow. They create really, really dense, um, sweet and fascinatingly delicious coffees. Um, very different from anything else. So if you visit the, the, the URL there that I was sharing, um, 
extractedmagazine.com slash ASW. There's a link to Puerto Mocha. I don't have, honestly, have any affiliation with them. I just think it's one of the most amazing experiences you can have. Um, you know, try it out. Okay, here we go. Let's get to the espresso brewing. Uh, I have to change my microphone also. All right, can you all hear me just fine? Is that working? Uh, yeah, so Yemen is able to export coffee out through the war. It's very challenging. Um, if you wanna read uh, a really good tale, uh, look for the Mocha Mocha book, um, highly recommended. Um, actually, uh, know the guy that book is written about, he's a good friend, <clears throat> met him a bit before that book was written actually, or a bit before the story that that book was written about. Okay, so here's the, one of the tricky aspects of, um, let me go back and forth with the camera here. So I have to, I have to change up my, um, my grinder here. Um, let's see, all the way down, to the espresso range. I'm going to do a little bit finer. Okay, I'm going to mute myself here for a second. Oh yeah, uh, civet coffee. Um, I hate talking about it. It's a terrible thing. Don't do it. It's like abusive to the animals. Um, it's horrible tasting. Do not support it. Do not do it. Avoid, avoid. Uh, that's what I think about civet coffee. Oh no, I only have nine grams of this. Um, okay, I'm gonna use a different coffee. <laughs> oh, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna use a different coffee. Hang on. Let me put this up here. Actually, this will be good. I'm going to use the uh, the Congo that I was using earlier, and that'll be a, a good comparison. So interesting about the Civic Coffee, little tidbit. Um, so when the Dutch stole the coffee from Yemen, one moment. So again, I'm I'm measuring out about 18 grams. Slightly more. Um, so when the Dutch stole the coffee from Yemen and took it to Indonesia, and they became the second most popular port for coffee in the world, growing and exporting Indonesian coffee, uh, they made it against the law for the locals to consume coffee. Well, the locals, they couldn't drink the coffee that they were growing, but they discovered that the local civets would eat the coffee and then in their excrement they found the seeds so they started brewing you know roasting and brewing that coffee uh, so it came about uh, from this this environment of of poverty and colonialist control um, and then you know some western person came along you know, 10, 15 years ago and was like, oh, I can make this fancy and make a lot of money with it. So it's, um, it's really quite a terrible story all around, to be honest. Uh, okay, coffee in. There's my quarter filter. All right. So this grinder has a nice add on for this. Um, I'm gonna Actually, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to weigh this out because I'm going to double check how much coffee goes into the portafilter. So I'm just, I'm zeroing out the scale. I can shift this slightly, I think. Zeroing out the scale so that when I add coffee to it, I can tell how much is in there. Uh, I'm going to mute myself again here real quick. Uh, 
All right, let's see. Should have about 18. I'll lose a clump there. That's all right. All right, well, actually, that's interesting. I put 18 and a half in, but I got 16.7 in here. So that's all right. What I'm actually going to look to do then is um, get about 34 grams out into the cup. So we're just going to run with that ratio. All right. So one of the things I like about this espresso machine, um, and it kind of feels like cheating, but you know, whatever. I don't, I just like making good coffee. I'm not really, uh, not really deep into the espresso, but this machine does a whole lot of the work for me. So I just need to get my coffee in there, tamp it down. Um, little thing on the tamp. So just pressure down and don't do the spin. That's irrelevant. Do not knock the side of it. That'll break up your puck. So just tamp down and then you're done. That's it. Um, that might be controversial for you, but honestly, I've talked with enough professionals and seen a lot of competitions and people doing the best things with espresso and that's really all you need to do. Okay. And then uh, one thing about this machine, which honestly I've never done is, so these, uh, come on please. All right, so these machines, these, these buttons are like pre-programmed to a certain amount of water. Um, let me get this back over here. Uh, so I got these buttons, like they come pre-programmed a certain amount of water. This machine does like pre-infusion and then puts a certain amount of water into it. Um, I know that this cup up to, up to about there is where I'm going to fill it. I know that'll give me about 34 grams. I'm just like, uh, I'm familiar with these cups. So I don't usually, you know, do this by volume, but I'm going to guess that that's about right. And then I'm going to double check by measuring on the scale. So uh, teared the scale with the cup, and now we're just going to go into the brew. So uh, I was mentioning the pre-programming because you can go in and change this. I could change how long it pre-infuses and then brews, for example, and how much it does. But um, I've been getting good results just eyeballing it. Um, and one of the nice things about this machine is it has incredible temperature and heats the water very fast very fast. Like, we're already going well here. And all right. Let's see what that gave us. 37. Not too bad. So 36. So that's not quite uh, one to two, but it's close. And um, Looks pretty good, no? So let me uh, pop back over here. Uh, not knock over my camera setup. Where am I? Here I am. Ooh. All right, let's see how it is. Hmm. So it's not quite right. But here's where the troubleshooting comes in. Um, it tastes, so I noticed two things. I don't know if you noticed this uh, on the, while you were watching the brew, but from the taste, it's, it's slightly sour. Uh, and it also looked like it was maybe coming out a little too fast. Uh, so I think uh, there's two things happening there. I think that perhaps um, I actually want more coffee in there. Well, one thing I could do is, is, is dial down the grind. So um, this is something else I didn't get into talking about, but troubleshooting, uh, troubleshooting your taste, troubleshooting your, your coffee. Um, when you taste the coffee, if it's too sour, that probably means either the grind is too fine or you haven't used enough. Typically it means the grind is too fine. I know that um, I, I find that this machine for me does best when I have 18 grams of coffee in there and I didn't quite have 18 grams. So that could be the issue that I'm having. And maybe I try it with 18 grams before I make the grind finer. Okay, 
the other side of it, so too sour, uh, grind is, did I say too fine? Grind is too coarse. If it's too sour, grind is too coarse. You want to make it finer. If it's, if it's bitter, if it's uh, astringent, um, like really, really clawing at the tongue, that probably means the grind is too fine and you want to make the grind coarser. So those are, those are like the two ranges that you want to look for if you're trying to troubleshoot and figure out your grind size. Um, in terms of figuring out how much coffee to use, uh, that can be a little bit more challenging to work out if, you, if you're in, like if you're doing brewed coffee and you're in that 17 to one ratio, um, that's really good to work with. If you're doing espresso and you're going uh, one in, two out, that's fine. Um, but you're, as far as espresso goes, your machine, like, like I experienced, your machine might perform better with a specific amount of coffee in it. So that's just, I think, something that you have to figure out by experimentation. Uh, all right, let me check on um, questions here. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, yes. So the, um, the coffee, that Congo coffee is from the uh, group Rebuild Women's Hope. Uh, have a look. Um, very excellent. I did a story on the, the creator of that group a couple of years ago. Uh, she's an uh, amazing woman who's done a lot of fantastic work for, for her people and her country. Um, and they make some really great coffee. So whenever I find that available, I try to get it uh, just because of the people, honestly. Um, but they also make really delicious coffee. And this one of the fascinating things that I found about coffee is the more you invest in the people, the closer you get to it, the more care that's put in uh, on, the, on, the, on every level, the farm, the production, the processing, the carrying, the roasting, the, the more that is invested, the better the coffee tastes. It has uh, that direct link. Um, and it's, uh, I feel like one of the few things we enjoy that um, you really can, you really can like invest in the good of something and you get a better tasting result. You really do. Yeah, that's sour. Not too sour though. Actually, as it, I might have needed to um, stir it a little bit. Here's an interesting tidbit. Um, I didn't uh, have room to fit this in on the slides, but <clears throat> uh, Jesse Roaster Conduit showed me this. Uh, if you, if I had like uh, three three cups, I could possibly do this. But um, espresso, as it comes out, comes out in layers. Uh, so typically it's a good idea, and I wasn't prepared for this and I have a spoon, typically it's a good idea to stir your espresso uh, so as to incorporate all the layers and get a more uh, consistent drink. Uh, but he likes to do a demonstration, he does tours of his roastery sometimes. Well, not right now with the pandemic, but he did before that. Um, oh man, I just realized my microphone's all the way over there. Have you all been able to hear me? I'm babbling along about coffee and I can't tell if the audio is good. Um, so uh, espresso and, and splitting up the espresso, it comes in layers. So he'll take three cups and then he'll uh, split the shot into thirds. So he'll have a cup for the first third and then he'll switch it for the second third and then the third third. And each of those has a vastly different taste. Uh, some of them, uh, I can't remember what the order is, but one of them is like really salty. There's a, there's a component to espresso that's remarkably salty. Um, and then there's a component that's really bitter. And then there's one that's like sweet and you combine the three and you get this fascinating uh, concoction. Um, so <laughs> honestly, when I do, oh yeah, it's different towards the bottom. I should have mixed it up. I still think it's slightly sour. And I think the only thing I need, I would need to do is, is just add a little more coffee. So that's, that's how I would do that. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Akos, for, uh, for watching. Um, I think we're just about wrapped up here. Uh, I don't really have anything else at the moment. Although I could talk about coffee for hours and hours. Uh, does anyone else have any more questions? Uh, if not, then, um, then we can call it good. Um, yeah. All right.